Okay, so um, what I thought I'd do today is something that I don't usually talk about, but I think it's the thing that's so important to consider. It's not really the main focus of my research, but it's the sort of side issues um, that I encountered, and I spent most of my time in my practice based practice as research project um, dealing with them. But as, as popular music studies move into the world of practice based research, um, we're increasingly confronted with ethical considerations. And these considerations, sort of new to many popular music scholars, have perhaps been dealt with. Ethnomusicologists and sociologists are all used to grappling with them. And today, I, what I want to do is reflect on my experience in my practice as a research project, which formed the basis of my PhD study, as well as a, a working music project. And rather than look at the core material, the focus of the research, I want to discuss the behind-the-scene works that went into the project. This is what in reality took up a great deal of time and energy. Um, yeah, and uh, I hope it's going to be of value for several reasons, because I think if you're going to enter a project where you're really very much inside it like that, it's good to be aware of all the extra stuff that goes on, really. And um, it also, I think, is very relevant today in bringing up the real, very real issues that face us in, in these what I consider a pretty dark times for the UK, really. Um, so just quickly, I'm going to just give, quickly give you a bit of background to my project. Um, when I did enter academia, I spent, didn't spend my whole life as a professional musician. When I entered academia and found out I could engage in practices research, I, I thought it was a great framework for me. It fitted in with my skill set and um, opened up a wide spectrum of research possibilities. And in fact, it was really a bit like an extension of what we as practitioners do anyway, I think. Um, okay. So when I did um, informing a band, in practices research project, the researchers faced with issues which to some extent ethnomusicologists and composers have had to deal with, namely ethical considerations and questions of artistic novelty. What I did through my practices research in forming and performing with a band in, is impacted on the lives and artistic development of the musicians involved, as well as the wider cultural landscape. With the band, which has achieved a degree of success, we created and continue to create new music contributing to artistic novelty. Through the band, the musicians broaden their musical experience, networks, and earning potentials. My primary aim, the, the, desire, the desire to explore the music similarities between Cuban and young Congolese music seems straightforward and achievable. It made sense to me. But when I embarked on this project, I had absolutely no idea about the hidden agenda and the amount of time and energy that behind the scenes issues would demand. So, this is a little bit about what I did. Having spent most of my life as a musician working in the field of Cuban music and salsa, when I embarked on a master's course, I decided to take the opportunity to look at a style of music that I loved but didn't know much about, namely Congolese music. And through my contacts, I managed to find that the underground scene of Congolese musicians working in, in I live in London. I, I, found the Cong I met a Congolese musician in London, and through him, I met this underground scene of Congolese musicians who were very much playing within their own community and within the Central and East African community. Um, luckily, I was a keyboard player because they've got fantastic guitarists and um, singers, but I ended up very quickly working on the Congolese music scene, the keyboard player on the thriving underground scene. Um, I soon began playing regularly with a 12-piece band, South Afri Afrique, in a Sunday night residence in Club Afrique, which was frequented entirely by a Central East African audience. We were there every Sunday night till 6 a.m., every Thursday night till midnight, rehearsing, like this public performance. This and other numerous performance activities, all within the community, gave me loads of ample opportunity to immerse myself in the music, learning a large repertoire, spending many hours hanging out with the musicians and their audience. And Club Afrique was very much a focal point for the community. And that's where I learned not just about the music, but also became part of to, to what was going on in the community, the gossip, and what was happening in people's lives. On the musical side, as I experienced playing in a Congolese band, I was struck by the amount of common ground it shared with Cuban music, both in terms of musical structure and performance practice. And I decided to bring the musicians together in a band, which formed the basis of my research project. 
So I think it's worth reflecting because what was striking to me, and that this applies to many communities, was that um, prior to my, my interference, none of these Congolese musicians have actually, um, none of the Congolese or Latin musicians I've played have ever met each other or come across each other in any way. In fact, and I talk more about the Congolese musicians because of their status in society, it was clear the Congolese musicians had had very little contact with anyone outside their community. And this made it particularly exciting when I did bring the musicians together. Um, but I'd like to look briefly at where the two groups of musicians in the UK come from. Um, the community of Latin musicians in the UK, which is a large community, long-standing, fairly large community of musicians playing a range of Latin styles. A lot of musicians arrived on tour as tourists or, or met a partner in their home country or came in many various different ways. There's also fairly frequent tours by, by groups from Latin America, less so now that the visa regulations have got so complicated, but from Colombia, from Cuba, the bands do come, so there's, there's constant ex exchange of artistic ideas. And, um, the musicians tend to be an in more integrated community of musicians, a mix of Latin, UK and other nationalities playing the music. And um, the audiences as well tend to be fairly integrated. Um, while there are performances within the, Latin, between the, within the Latin communities, in particular the large Colombian community we have, there's many activities that attract a broad audience. In contrast, the Congolese musicians in the UK, it's a relatively small and isolated community of musicians. The musicians I worked with, all of them had arrived here with a band and sought asylum when they arrived. Um, they're isolated from the home-based artists because of the difficulties of obtaining visas and the actions of the Congolese pressure group, which I'll talk briefly about, the combat on. And the musicians mostly, in my experience, only mix with Congolese and other Central and East African people. And the performances, when I came along, were mostly restricted to within the Congolese and wider East and Central African communities. It was actually striking for me that there were these amazing musicians with fantastic skills that were completely hidden. Okay, I'm going to just talk briefly now about the, the three musicians, three of the musicians who I work with in my band. I've worked with various different Congolese musicians, but these three guys are uh, working with me and have been with me for ages. Eugene Kuta arrived here with Congolese singer General Defau in the late 90s. He's considered to be one of the top voices on the UK scene. He's got a beautiful voice. Eden arrived with a lesser known Congolese band in the early 2000s. Initially, he was a dancer, but he's developed as a singer. And the third musician, and perhaps the most significant to my story, really, Kianfu Kasongo, known as Burkina Faso or Bokalia, is, is one of the most famous guitarists in Pan Africa. Arrived in 2006 with a top Congolese singer, and he was one of the, of the guitarists in the Democratic Republic of, of Congo, instrumental in developing Congolese popular music and bringing his folkloric ideas into popular music. When I went back to Congo and he'd been out of the country for nine years, he was, everyone said he's my favorite guitarist. I'm not gonna do my quote because I'm, I'm gonna play you a little clip from playing the guitar in the studio. How much time have I had so far? About ten minutes. Good. Okay. Okay. I did want to play you a little bit of that out loud just so you get to feel of it. Because this isn't a very um Cheer up my dizzy the top it, top it with. <laughs> I'm going to have to click a few buttons here. Here's a little bit of us playing on the way to stay of the summer last year.
I've liked before I go back to my um, just click a few more buttons. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to move quickly on now to talk about. Um, there were many, it was such a fascinating project. I mean, the band still carries on. It was the subject of my, my PhD. Um, many, many aspects of bringing the two cultures together that made fantastic, fascinating research material. To have two styles of music that had so much in common, but groups of musicians who were so, so separated. And there were so many things about communication, language, cultural norms, and expectations. I also, I learned so much about things about, on, as side issues, I also found out about a particularly Congolese problem which is the strong link between politics and Congolese music. It's a very complex, complicated relationship. And also saw firsthand um, the toll that the whole, our whole, what I consider to be a failed asylum system takes on the people. And that's really what I found when I started writing about this. We'll take the first of our presentation. So, these combat, the combatant, I wanted to just mention them because this is a thing that people outside the community don't know about. The situation for people from the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, is complex. The UK and indeed other countries acknowledge that there is a link between politics and music with the DRC. And um, musicians from that country survive through sponsorship, private, political, independent. If you're a musician working there, you, you have to sing for people or pay you for the sponsor you or you don't get any money. There is an actual group known as the Combatants in the diaspora who oppose the President Kabila. They boycott people and organisations who they perceive supporting the President. In terms of musicians, this basically means anyone who is based in that country who tries to play abroad, they, have, they, have, um, they make use of demonstrations and threats of violence and, and extremely successful in preventing performances and shutting down Here's a church they shut down in, in the UK because they thought the pastor was uh, supporting the RC. Oh yeah, that was an article. The first one was an article, an article paper someone was giving at Oxford about the combat on. It's a hidden problem that they know, but other people don't know. This includes all the DRC musicians who have received to support the president. So it's resulted in there being a complete separation, physical separation, between artists based, home based artists and artists, artists in the diaspora because they're unable to go and play in other countries. But I think there's huge implications for live performance, no exchange or interaction other than on the internet. The community's static. And the musicians in the diaspora have, are also obliged to say they support the combatant or the combatant or, or will boycott them. As my a guitarist said, I'm a combatant because the situation is clear, but the musicians in Kin, Kinshasa, have no choice. They have to sing for the government to get money. They don't like it, but they have to do it for money. Yeah? So, the fact that they have to say they're combatant, they, they further isolates them from the home-based musicians, but also makes them a target for persecution when they should be returned. In fact, here's an article from The Guardian in 2014 showing how they were selecting people to torture when they arrived back if they were Combat on. So they're in this catch-22 position, they're stuck. Now, in terms of UK visas, there's constant and increasing concern about the complexity and uncertainty of, of in terms of the UK borders agency, if I look at visas, there's awareness of what's going on with the visa situation, I think. I mean, in my community, Latin and African music, we've been fairly, we've been aware of this for a long time, but it's really coming out in public. It's becoming commonplace for touring acts to leave the UK out of their tours completely. In fact, this is an article from The Guardian in August this year because WOMAD and several other festivals really suffered this year because they've made the, they've made the visa system ridiculously unworkable. They've made it expensive, costly, time-consuming. The article goes on to say, questions have been raised about what this means for the future of world music in the UK. Festivals co-founder Peter Gabriel this week released a statement calling the situation alarming and asked, do we really want a white bread in Brexit flatland, a country that is losing the will to welcome the world? Channel 4 News' John Snow meanwhile tweeted the hostile environment took its toll that were mad a number of events were seriously affected by visa refusal. By definition, a festival of world music requires visas for many bands. What on earth is the Home Office doing? Is music the new enemy? Um, 
And at the end, uh, Alison Phipps is a professor in Glasgow. If the current situation is not reviewed and improved, everything is going to get a lot harder. The UK will be isolated. Artists bring us to a relationship with a difference. They play a line of music we've not heard before, and we welcome it in our lives when enriched. A hostile environment is trying to make our lives dull and stupid. Um, this is clearly a very worrying situation and completely detrimental to the cultural landscape of the UK. But what about the people who are the musicians who are already here and to some extent stuck? So, as we all know, immigration is a hot topic, topic for governments. Um, for many years, the UKBA, I mean, I mean, assuming people are aware of this, but I don't know, I don't, for many years, people, the UKBA have had a poor track record in dealing with asylum claims. This is an article from The Guardian in 2012. Senior UK board of agency officials have been accused of misleading Parliament after a Daniel report saying they've wrongly claimed the backlog of asylum and immigration cases. Um, they keep changing the regulations for asylum and rules about what asylum seekers can do. The reality is, there's an underclass of people struggling to survive in the UK. All of the musicians I work with are what are called long-term cases. So the singer Makuta has been here since since last century, and he's he's a, he's a, he's a nobody. The guitarist, who's one of the most famous guitarists in Africa, has been here 11 years. Um, he's a nobody. This is a report from Refugee Council, Chief Inspector reports UKBA failing to process asylum claims. The figures they try and produce don't tell the true picture, but this is the everyday reality that I learned from the Congolese people. Right? Um, they're not allowed to legally work, paid or voluntary, very limited access to health care, no access to benefits or financial support, no entitlement to housing, required to sign on on a regular basis. They have everyone this great big queues in London Bridge. When you sign on, you don't know whether you're going to be detained. My drummer was detained for five months and then deported. The guitarist was detained for a few months and then we got him out. The government made these sweeping changes to legal aid, which effectively shut down refugee legal centres, no free legal representation for, for people seeking asylum. There's an article about it. And here's some um, documents, government documents, saying you're not allowed to work when we're considering your asylum. Failed asylum seekers cannot be seen to be residents and can't use the health service. Some head scare headline from an express newspaper. So what does it mean in practice for us as a band? What it means is in you, you end up being a support network, and that would include things like finding and liaising with solicitors, writing to MPs, paying legal fees, going to immigration meetings, visiting detention centres, um, bailing out um, setting up support next for people to visit, court appearances. When my guitarist was in, in um, detention, we ended up bailing him out, myself and, a, and a, a friend, and he had to live in my house for three and a half years on his bail conditions. But um, you end up... Uh, it's very frustrating as musicians, because how can we progress? How can we develop and be creative under these, under these terrible conditions? There's times that musicians have had to drop out of gigs because they feel that the board and the agency are, are on top of them. And it's, I've seen the tremendous states of, among the Congolese community, you see this tremendous mental and physical strain on people and um, complete stranglehold on artistic development. So I just quickly was thinking, well, what does this mean? When you're choosing to put a band together, do you work with the best musicians or those who have their legal status resolved? Loads of managers and agents and people I know will, will not touch musicians who don't have their legal status resolved, but you miss out on all these amazing people. To what extent do you support the musicians? How do you negotiate the ethical issues arising from this popular situation? And how do you, pro how do you develop a project and realise potential with such restrictions? So, I find it a very worrying and very grim subject, but I just, this is what I think. The wider audience is generally unaware of restrictions on musicians. There's an acceptance that what we, what they have served up is what is available. I think it has implications. This and the whole, the whole freedom of movement in and out of the UK has a lot of implications for the live music scene because people aren't getting, aren't getting access to the great music they could be getting access to. 
The combination of factors that restrict musical creativity and diverse cultural influence was surely impacting the cultural landscape of the UK. Short sighted, misguided, and inhumane treatment of refugees is depriving the UK of talented individuals who have made great contribution to society. And in spite of the fact that the global audience is growing for music which is not American or British, the UK visa immigration asylum policy and inefficiency is stifling diversity. I don't have any answers, but I just thought you should know. Thank you very much. <laughs> I actually have a Congolese student. I, I imagine, I've never asked him, but I imagine it's probably, it's probably second generation. Yeah. Oh, right, wow. Yeah, yeah. Great. Right. Any questions? So. I don't know, Sarah. It could be Sarah. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's, I guess, a question and a comment. Um, in, in maybe adding to the doom and gloom, in, in the 90s, I was really active with the Congolese and Zairean music community in Boston, which is also huge. And there is also a huge Latin community, a Latin musician community there as well. Um, and I guess the, um, the sad part is, is that the stories you're telling now are no different a few decades ago. Uh, the, the comment is one thing that helped us at that time, and US policy and UK policy are very different, it's a different world now, but a lot of the um, uh, Zaire and Congolese musicians, we were able to, when they volunteered and we were able to set up a lot of master classes at the local universities, and although they might not have been paid, uh, when it came time to petition harder for their status or visas, we were able to, to demonstrate, look at how they're giving to the community, and you could get a large university behind them saying, yes, they came, and there were X number of students there, and this is a valuable petition. So I don't know whether that's a, a route you've taken. Well, it's funny, because I did my PhD at SOAS, and I do I teach at SOAS, and I learn this stuff, so we're actually very linked with SOAS, my band. In fact, we always play at the graduation ceremonies there, and, and also... And then we've done master classes there and at Cardiff University yeah. and, and all sorts of places. And it was, you would not believe how many letters I, I and, other, and other colleagues and academics and even have written yeah. in support of them and write written to MPs as well. UKBA, they don't answer. Yeah. In fact, they sent round, because you know, you, you, you email, and they, they said to Burkina Faso, they'd, give him, they'd resolve his case within a year, uh, within three months, or two years later, we'd have not heard back from them. Then they sent him an email, and it was a customer survey to see how they were doing. <laughs> but we, we, we've, trying we've done an awful lot of stuff. And he is desperate. He's an amazing guitarist. He's absolutely desperate to go into schools and be teaching, but yeah. you're just stuck. Yeah. Can I ask a, a question? Another parallel from that time, or one thing I noticed, that in Boston, um, the, the, um, uh, the, the Cuban influence, because they weren't from Cuba, but uh, the Latin musicians tended to travel in, ja in jazz circles. And um, they were often booked in jazz clubs. And the audiences, um, a lot of it was jazz audiences, right? Where the Congolese musicians, um, the audience is expected to dance. And these were really two different audiences. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering whether that's been your experience as well, and maybe kind of bridging some of those gaps might help. Well, I think that what my project, because my project brings together co uh, Congolese and Latin musicians, mm -hmm. and actually we've become very, we're, we're working loud and we're very popular with many different audiences. So we'll play, because I'm at the same in the States, all the, the South audience, they're all obsessed with dance classes and things. So, but we, there's, they love it, mm -hmm. especially. Um, we also play to Congolese audiences. We also play to mainstream festivals, which are either the audiences for Congolese and, or, or Latin music. But the music is such great dance music and so accessible. So what we've done with Grupo Lakuta, which is what I sort of alluded to at the beginning, is we've, we've, ex we've exposed a lot of the world to contemporary Congolese music. People who wouldn't, listen, who wouldn't go out and listen to that music. So we've, we sort of cover all bases there. And it's just something that's really great about the project. It's not only the musicians meeting for the first time, there's audiences who are being exposed to that music for the first time. <laughs>